welcome to all of you here in Kuhlhaus Berlin. And of course, it's polite and civilized to welcome an audience at an event like this. But in this case, I think it's even more appropriate and more heartfelt to really welcome you because it's not a given to see people in the same space, in the flesh, in real time. Um, of course, respecting all limitations that are a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. But you're here, the audience is here, and uh, quite some artists could make it to Berlin as well. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Marcel Feil, I'm FOMS artistic director and uh, we're here for the premiere of the foam talent exhibition um, as i assume one knows we present an, a talent magazine every year i think we have been doing this for the last 12 to 13 years already um, a magazine in which we present artists young emerging artists that we think are uh, well exceptionally talented and might be a reason for uh, both professionals and photography lovers to follow them and to follow their development and closely witness their artistic achievements. Uh, also this year, we have selected artists from our annual talent call, which resulted in over uh, 1,700 submissions. So the group that we have here are, like to our opinion, uh, the best of the best. Uh, it's always a bit subjective and uh, things might change and talents of course are never a given that, they, that their potential will be fully realized but we are absolutely confident that this will happen with this group. Uh, we're here in Coolhouse uh, for the exhibition and also for our talks with the artists here uh, this afternoon. Um, I have to say that it's uh, an exceptional year. Uh, for various reasons. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic that has uh, hit the whole planet and all elements of society is a, a, a strong reason why this is an exceptional year. Because we intended to have presentations earlier this year in the spring uh, in New York and London and also later in Paris, also in Amsterdam during Unseen, the fair that is uh, that is organized in foam every uh, year in September. This all uh, had to be cancelled, mostly because of all the uh, fairs were cancelled, but also because of the uh, locations that would host the exhibition simply couldn't host the exhibition. So we were quite pleased that uh, in Berlin, in Kuhlhaus, we are able with all limitations to present the exhibition. Um, later on, the exhibition will also travel to, uh, to Amsterdam and from mid-December uh, until early April 2021 the exhibition will also be presented in, in our museum. Um, our museum is a wonderful location but completely different being in 17th and 18th century uh, mansions, completely different from Coolhouse Berlin which used to be a cool house so this is a big concrete piece of architecture uh, which allows all the artists to present the work, I think, in, an, in a wonderful way, because it's not so much a group show, it's perhaps more individual presentations of all the artists. And you can really enter the space of one artist, fully experience their work, get out and walk to another presentation. I think it's, it's a wonderful additional quality of this uh, specific location. Um, but for today, um, we will, of course, talk with the artists, and all the artists present will also present themselves. Uh, the names are already here behind me. Um, present at the moment are Aji J, Camillo Pascarelli. Adesokan is on his way, so he will be here. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, Benoit Janet here as well, Albazari, and also two guests. Annemarie Beckman and Felix Hoffmann from the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation and SEO Berlin. Uh, we will end the uh, uh, set of Q&As and artist presentations um, and perhaps come to some conclusions about this generation of artists that is, well, uh, presenting themselves to the stage, also this stage, in, uh, in a society in a times that are characterized by, by uncertainty, uncertainty on all levels. Uh, according to the health situation, of course, with the pandemic, but also uncertainty, political uncertainty, economical uncertainty, ecolo ecological challenges. So there's a lot going on in these changing times and changing societies. Uh, and in a way, we might feel to be in, in limbo, which is also 
the title of this uh, of this afternoon. So in limbo means that we're somewhere between salvation and damnation. The train has left the station, but the destination is unclear. We are somewhere in the midst, but we've got no idea of, of direction. And perhaps we can also talk about how photography can perhaps, quite modestly, contribute to finding a path out of this uh, uncertain times. It's perhaps a huge uh, um, responsibility, but I think art and culture reflects uh, our time perhaps best uh, uh, or perhaps in a way that can only be done by, by artists. So I think this is a very valuable topic to also uh, address. But for us also very important is to give the artists the floor and to allow them to present themselves and their work to an audience, of course the audience here in Berlin, but also an audience that is not present in Berlin because this, this uh, afternoon will be uh, recorded. Uh, and will be uh, shared with a much larger audience uh, later on. So also a welcome to everyone, not in Berlin, but looking at the screen. Uh, great that you're all witnessing this, this afternoon. Um, the menu, the schedule, so to speak, is, is behind me. Um, I mentioned the artists. I forgot one. Jorgos, Jathro Manilakis, who is sitting there. Um, he prefers not to speak, but I can tell, please have a look at his work, because I think he made a wonderful um, new chapter in his, uh, the way he presents his work. It's a, it's a projection, uh, and it, it is wonderful. But all artists are, of course, equally great. Uh, not in the least, Aji, Aji J. Can I uh, ask you to come to the fore? Because you will give a, a 10 minutes uh, presentation, talk more about yourself and your work, which is also here on, on the sites. The beautiful, uh, if I can characterize it as red and yellow display. But please tell us all about it and uh, take the microphone. Uh, Aji. Hello? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. So, let me see. How do we get here? There we go. So, hello everyone and again, thank you for joining us for um, this afternoon. So, I'll just give a brief presentation about the project and how it started and, yeah, how come that it developed in the way it did. Um, so, I started Magic Cube um, pretty much like six years ago with the intention of combining two different perspectives within one project. One that will look into a geopolitical sort of spectrum and the other one that will look into the, the economy of the arts and, and how specifically works from, photographic work from West Africa have been sort of, yeah, circulating within the, uh, the art economy. So starting from the geopolitical aspect, um, it starts from like a very personal um, experience, meaning that when I, when I was in Senegal with my family, in my several travels, whatever, um, I was always very fascinated, not necessarily in a positive sense, of uh, how much stock cube was used to, to make food. Like the incredible amount of it, um, especially during Magal or other um, very important celebration where food making was required. And how come that everyone within the private sphere would wear, you know, all this Maggi, Jumbo, Aja, whatever else kind of brand uh, of stock cubes? And, and how come that pretty much everywhere I would go, I would see advertisement of these products? And, uh, and the name they would take, like Aja, for instance, that it's like my name. So, you know, very direct sort of um, aiming, which is a female subject. And also the slogans that they would use, like with Maggie, every woman is a star, or with Maggie, your man is not gonna look for a second wife or whatever. Um, so I started to like make some research, you know, basic research on how come. And uh, it was interesting to see that it was present not just you know, in the past uh, decades, but since pretty much the end of the 19th century, so after the Berlin Conference. 
and, uh, and since then it really became one of the key ingredients. And what is interesting is that how this brand, these strategies that these companies use are e extremely attached to the uh, performative aspect of tradition. So not only you have it in the billboards and the advertisement, but also Maggie especially makes this very big event like festivals that almost look like, uh, I don't know, Maga or Tabasco or whatever else which are very typical uh, celebration in Senegal. And, uh, and yeah, so you would feel like in this totally traditional space, yet fully branded. Um, so this is one side. Then the other side, when I talk about the art economy, I talk about, well, the work of Malik Sidi Bey, Seydou Keita, Mama Kasset, Omar Lee. And in 2010, around that time, I started to notice their work more and more often in big institutions and, in, uh, you know, art fairs, body photo, whatsoever. Um, but what kind of, what kind of struck me in somehow was the way in which those work were looked at and, uh, and, and really, again, the way they would, uh, in which they would circulate um, that I found, yeah, again, a bit disturbing because it was um, very much this, this looking into you know someone else's uh, sort of uh, space and then at the same time you know pointing at those photographers as a representative of an entire continent which is I mean all the names that I just mentioned they're from Mali and from Senegal so you know Africa is, is a big space um, so yeah and 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 then I started to also wonder you know how they came into like the market and especially there is a thing that we, we don't like perhaps very much to discuss about, but the, the, the question of identity politics within art. Um, so you had waves and you know, and sometimes people would say, oh, this is the African year, you know, this is the Asian year or whatever else. Um, so that was also something that kind of really disturbed me. And, and also at the same time, um, for instance, how institutions would um, invite this photographer to be in, it was in this, again, very performative cultural way. So where, for instance, uh, people would be invited to like pose in the background of Malik Sidibe or other things, um, which, yeah, I just, uh, I, I just found disturbing. So um, what I then thought of interesting, you know, of looking into is, is the question of consumerism. How do we consume culture and how do we perform culture? And that's how this project came to be. And, um, but what I was, you know, even though in somehow there is, you know, this casting of questions of, that I just mentioned, and there is a tautological aspect in a way that I, that I present them, I was very obviously interested in creating a break um, in, this, in this constant consuming of the so-called other. Um, and that's the reason why in my picture then you have this, you know, this, this, uh, this subject that sort of cover their face and then somehow they give them, you know, they're not revealing their identity on the one hand and on the other you have, you know, for instance, like a, a white subject wearing a, wet, a, a black mask. So there is, a, it creates a bit that interest of, of looking into something, of discovering a bit of history, but at the same time it's like a coming back of, you know, of what is the history of Europe and the expansion it had through a god, in this case, the stock cube, and through simply the, you know, the, the cultural expansion it has. So that's, that's pretty much what I would like, yeah, what I wanted to say about this <laughs> in this space. I hope, yeah, that's good. <laughs> And we continue with the wonderful Camillo, who made it also, who made it here from Italy. We were very happy because it was actually sometimes for some artists a bit of a challenge to come tonight. So very happy for everyone who made it. And Camillo is showing one of his uh, projects on the third floor. And um, yeah, maybe we go directly into your work and you can tell us a bit more about you because you are, I come from anthropology, but you worked in photojournalism and this project is a very, in a way a departure or uh, another chapter of your work. So maybe you can give us a bit of a short introduction. Thanks. So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks to Fon for inviting us and to create this wonderful venue in this uncertain time. 
And uh, yeah, so I will start from far away somehow. I started to work in Kashmir, in this place, in this project is about Kashmir. And very briefly, I will explain the geopolitical context because it is a kind of unknown issue in the Western countries. So Kashmir is this contested land between India and Pakistan since 1947. They have been fought like three wars, four wars for owing this, this land. And in 1948, a UN um, resolute pushed two countries to implement a referendum asking the, the people of Kashmir whether they would like to join Pakistan or India. This referendum has never been implemented and has been the source of resentment of the people against the Indian administration because they've been working in the Indian side of Kashmir. And uh, I ended up in Kashmir by, by chance in 2010. I was traveling around India and I ended up in Kashmir by chance. I didn't want to go there because I just knew it was a dangerous place, contested land, conflict land. But I ended up there and I discovered a wonderful place full of poetic approach by the people who are reciting uh, poems of uh, Persian and, and Indian and Pakistani poets, even if like they are uh, working on a tea stall on the road. And I started to discover the, uh, what, what does it mean to approach a geopolitical issue on the ground? What does it mean to be in a place who has like this international dispute and who are the people living there? And what do they think? Because I discovered that Kashmiri people actually are asking for being independent, whether from India or Pakistan. So I started to study about that. I started to study anthropology and I came back in 2015 for my field work for my anthropology dissertation for my master. I spent there six months and I was studying the political subjectivity of Kashmir. So I was interrogating the role of memory, religion, and the political subject of the people. Um, I spent there six months. There's not much to do there. So I needed to get in touch with the people. I need to explore the, the field work. And I decided to spend my days working uh, in a wood, in a wood workshop. Uh, so there is a long tradition of woodworking there. And uh, that allowed me to understand in a different way, a less analytical and a more emotional way, a daily, daily life of this place, which is today one of the most militarized zone of the world. So India is, is uh, having like half of his army into the region. So starting from there, the, the knowledge that I got from this place was very much an emotional uh, approach. We, I was like, of course, using the anthropological tool, but then the emotional and the uh, intimate approach of this worked. So very, very quickly, I, I ended my studying in anthropology, but I needed some more, um, another way of communicating which was fitting my, my person more than writing, because usually anthropologists write. And so I started to, to take pictures. I was doing it since many years. I decided to, to try to use it in a more conscious way. And naturally, I decided to study photojournalism. So I kept going on Kashmir for two years more, but I was working you know, as a proper photojournalist. So I was looking for information, these context, contexted images, and, uh, and then after two years, I was really unsatisfied with the, with the images I was creating, with the, with the representation I was creating. And that's when it came like a, a very crucial moment that closed a circle in a way, and that's what we're realizing. Because that emotional approach that I had, very intimate, when I was studying anthropology, came back. Why? Because I decided to start shooting stills in Kashmir in a completely free way, without any um, scheme in my mind, not looking for anything, just reacting through my body, through my emotions, to what I was looking at. And, uh, but then at the end, I didn't want to do a self-referential project, saying, okay, this is, my, this is Camillo's point of view on Kashmir. I, I needed a, a specific point of view. So I was wondering, who can, be, who can give me a point of view which allowed me to work in this way. And then when the children point of view came out. So 
I, I, was, I was trying to put myself into the shoes of children. How? Being, re reacting to uh, the emotional input give, getting in Kashmir. So, and children doesn't perceive reality in a create, real and rational way. They just see something, they don't even get the meaning of this because it's a cultural meaning that a box needs for a box. We, we, we give a cultural significance to that. For a children, it's just something, an object that can be anything. And in this way, I started to work in Kashmir, creating this body uh, of, of work. And I mean, it would be interesting, maybe you could, if you could say something about the poem that is actually displayed together with the work, because you spoke about this more emotional connection and the poetry that was also is very common in the place. So it could be interesting if you could give us a little insight into the connection with the poem that is now selected. Yeah. Um, so the attachment of the Kashmiri people to poetry is from their uh, is from their religion. So they are a Muslim majority region, which is an issue because India is an is a Hindu majority region. So religion is an issue on Kashmir issue, and but they believe in this um, another uh, smaller sector of Islam, the Sufism, the devotional uh, side of of Islam. And uh, Sufism believe that the connection between you and God is through poetry. So they are very much into poetry in this way. The project is called Monsoons Never Cross the Mountains, which is a, as a verse from a poet, a Kashmiri poet named Aga Shahid Ali, which is not a Sufi saint, is a, a normal poet, who escaped Kashmir in, in the 90s, when there was a, a huge and super violent civil war between Indian army and the armed groups of Kashmiri people. And uh, Monsoon Snare Across the Mountains really explains this natural, again, uh, difference of Kashmir comparing to India. Why? Because in India you have roughly two, two seasons. You have when it's not raining and the monsoon season when it's raining. But Kashmir is in the north of India and is covered by the Himalaya mountains which doesn't allow the, uh, the wind of monsoons to get in. So visually what you have there is like four seasons exactly how we have, uh, as we have in Europe. So this natural, um, this natural position against the Indian, uh, the Indian uh, nation was really uh, explained by this, uh, by this verse. And I would be interesting to hear now that you have, in a way, concluded the project, you're publishing a book. This is also the slides that we're seeing are actually combinations that are also made in the book. It could be interesting to know now that you have completed uh, the project and you're kind of moving on. I would be curious how it maybe has influenced your photojournalistic work or if you are planning to continue in this more non-linear narrative photography now. Yeah, and um, I think I'm, I'm still doing both, I would say. Like, this is a path that I started with this project that is kind of finding my voice. And I think I found it, not with this visual style, but I, th I found this approach very interesting. And while I'm still doing both, I'm still doing with, I'm, I'm not doing photojournalism, I'm just like doing editorial with magazines, so keeping these two tracks on two different lines that maybe can be intertwined sometimes or, or, or they just maybe keep going parallel. And I think there was something interesting you mentioned when we were speaking because of course the title of the event also asks in a way about this current situa situation and as your work is very much connected with travel but now you are staying in Italy, um, I think it was nice how you spoke about your changed relationship with media as a window, maybe you can just give us a little insight in how this time has actually changed some of those views of yours. Yeah, uh, I will just add one thing that I forgot before uh, regarding the title, is speaking about season in Kashmir as a particular reason, on, not only because of you know, this visual presence of different, uh, different seasons, but it's because this issue has been going on since 1947, so it's super long. And what's happening there is that uh, every year you have season of protests, people uh, gather on the streets trying to protest, people getting killed. And this is something that keeps going on every two years, every three years. But nothing has changed. 
at the higher level. Still the same situation of uh, 1948. So also speaking about this continuous uh, um, yearly passing of season through the uh, autumn, summer, and, and the others, also recall this uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a limbo where Kashmir is stuck, which is kind of outside history, outside of in this continuous uh, cycle of, 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 of nothing. Um, yeah, so how does it affect? Well, I mean, uh, how did it affect? But I think that it's more interesting to say another uh, thing. I mean, we can't travel. I've been, I always, majority of my projects are outside Italy, sometimes very often outside Europe. I was uh, planning to do a project in uh, US and in Italy about the legacy of Christopher Columbus. So you can imagine how possible is to get in the US and working there now. And so that is gone. So I mean, I took a chance to work in Italy. So I'm doing another project in Italy, working on a river, the Tiber River that th goes through um, Rome. But super quickly, I will just say that um, for me, being in Italy was super interesting. And coming from a um, photojournalism uh, school, uh, for the first time, we were watching uh, images of like piles of body of dead people coming from not even your country, like just literally behind your your corner, and we were close at home. That was the only window on on, on outside the world, and this can sounds banal, but it really felt like you. I really realized it that you know. We were used to watch these kind of images coming from the other side of the world or always from far away of people of another, or of another even visually we were not used to, to, to see people of uh, our same kind of, of, of color of skin. There was only once when, we, when it happened that like during the war in, in, in the Eastern countries in Yugoslavia in 91, that kind, because in Italy we were surrounded and then like overwhelmed by these images, you open the window, you, sorry, you open the TV, you open the internet, you open these uh, mobiles. And uh, this was something that uh, re really made me think about our, our relationship to the world outside. And when he's telling something that is happening behind the corner, which was this time completely different from the other side. And I have no conclusion if, about that, but that was something that really made me, made me, made me think. Well, thank you so much for this personal end note. And um, well, Camilo's work is here and he will also be here so you can also continue the conversation with him. But now we are gonna move on and because Adesokan is still on the Metro, I will, uh, in the magic of a live event, just skip him now and he will come back. Is he here? Actually, he just arrived, just in time. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm going to sit. Exactly. You can slide here. The first one is the video. You can just like that it maybe. Yeah. Then there's one.
can hear me uh, I'm really sorry for just coming it's really hard to be uh, a Nigerian now with what's happening in the country uh, the killings by the, the government uh, I have a couple of friends who are protesters and uh, it's quite heavy so I'm sorry I couldn't uh, really function properly today but thank you for waiting <laughs> and uh, I talk about the work uh, so PVC Midway was, uh, was quite experimental for me. Uh, I've been very quite aware uh, from a very young age as an artist. Uh, no thanks to my father who was a practicing psychologist uh, and to sort of understand my father. You know, I try to read a lot of his books and you know, pay attention to our psychoanalytic processes. And that's always been there with me. Uh, I always like to, to create for some way. And so this was me taking up some responsibility as an artist. And uh, I wanted to, you know, uh, intervene. You know, I'd seen the, the, the goriness, how the, the meat was, you know, being transported. And I wanted to, you know, just tell the story of or document their reality. I wanted to also make them see themselves in a different way. And my work has always been, always been about uh, subtle, uh, suggestions, you know, uh, perhaps the work might not look so subtle, but it's always for the people that I create the work for. And um, we spent some time, I did, you know, the best way to, you know, go in there and to, you know, make them see. And we decided to, this is me and the, the fashion designer I collaborated with, to make some really nice looking PVC outfits, you know, that were stylish and functional. And when we got to the market stall, because usually in the market stall, the the meat is so bare, you know, there's that hygiene is always an afterthought. And so we went in there, spent some time with them, and then decided to come back with this. And when we got there, we just decided to photograph. Uh, a lot of my work for me is always uh, happening in the you know, mental space. Uh, I spend about 10% actually creating and about 90% of my time thinking about the effect of what it is that I would do and how to present and suggest. And so it was quite exciting to go in there and everything was just organic, you know. They grabbed the, the uh, PVC materials from us, they wore them, and under 10 minutes we already had these great images and it's like, oh, wow. And so uh, that was uh, a confidence boost for me to take up more responsibility as an artist, uh, to uh, find unique ways to tell stories differently, to be myself more, you know, because also in my research for creating, I. I see a lot of images and a lot of work that, you know, just look great on the wall and they don't have an impact. And so part of what I decided to do with uh, the other collaborators was to present these works on the street, you know, to let these people see how cool and wonderful they look, you know, and also to, to show them that they can also have innovative solutions by themselves. Uh, and so that was PVC Midway, which was two years ago. And uh, my trajectory has really changed because uh, I've also taken up some more responsibility now. I'm currently at the Van Eyck in the in Maastricht uh, for a year-long research residency. I've uh, no longer shied away. I think also, um, you know, with the, everything that's happening with the, with the pandemic, uh, you know, with the current uh, uh, killings happening in Nigeria, you know, uh, there's... I think what the, the space that the pandemic gives for me as a creative is to reassess myself, you know, to, 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 to understand the whys, to why I create as a person, and perhaps to, you know, even take up more responsibility. But uh, 
you know, it's, it's really, really hard when you're creative from Africa, within Africa. You don't have the institutions and the infrastructures to support you. And, and so it sort of made it really hard to even function, you know, because everything gets canceled or postponed or, you know, just abruptly pulled out. And, uh, you know, you spend a lot of time reassessing and re-strategizing, you know, and having to find other ways of being. Or if you're not a, if you don't have a strong mental resilience, you know, you compromise and you stop creating because you have to survive. And so I think there's been the effect of the pandemic uh, for me. Uh, uh, but it, you know, you, you just wake up and then you continue to be yourself. Uh, I think I'm open to questions here. If you have any questions about the work, I'm sorry I'm not really in the best frame today. Uh, I just really try to, you know, function uh, as a person today. And uh, I really wish I could say more about the work, but uh, I think uh, that's as much as I can. And thank you for your time and thank you for listening. And once again, I'm sorry for being very late. Thank you, Amelie. Um, hello, everybody. I am uh, Miriam Koyman, curator at FOAM and curator of this exhibition. Been watching it. Nice. So nice to have you here. Um, I'm, um, I have to apologize immediately that your work had to make way a little bit for uh, at this event because we're sitting in your presentation. Um, uh, so we're already seeing some sculptures here and this, but right after this event, will put your work back uh, onto the wall and the pedestal and a lot of sculptural elements because actually that's a, a really interesting part of your practice is that it has a photographic starting point but um, uh, your photography evolves into sculptural elements and um, especially here for this project Escape from Paradise that actually entails a whole research on the Hawaiian myth. So if you would summarize your project, how would you <laughs> do that? Um, summarizing is pretty, it's pretty hard for me because the, the project is involving a lot of different elements. So just let me know if I go like too much in details and we are short on time. Um, but I think how the project have been built is involving how I uh, change a bit my methodology of work and uh, how I've been working a bit less with the camera and a bit more uh, through uh, photography and more than uh, with the camera. Um, I think the project started um, around 2016, something like this. And I used to have a much more documentary uh, and landscapes um, way of working before. And at the point I I was thinking a bit what was the um, responsibility of photographers and artists on uh, producing uh, new images in our era where uh, images are already overflowing us. So at point I started just to don't travel anymore um, because that was also the kind of ecological question about why traveling to make a picture and what can be the impact of them. And so I started just to think a bit in the other side and uh, started working by making the images traveling to the studio, like physically at the first time. Um, and yeah, that, uh, that's a bit how the, the work started with, uh, I was a bit fascinated and uh, I developed an obsession with the kind of popular perception of the perception of the exotism. And so for me, like every like beginning uh, our starting point of project start with pretty uh, instinctive uh, feelings. So I don't know exactly why, but I started to uh, order uh, posters and images from eBay just uh, with using uh, keywords as uh, exotism landscapes or tropical landscapes. And it became a, a way trying to um, localize the exotism. So of course, that was the starting point of a huge research about what is the exotism and uh, what is the popular perception uh, for 
um, someone from Europe, so from my own point of view. And uh, one very popular representation is the Hawaiian shirt. Um, and you started collecting that, not necessarily to wear it yourself, but to turn it into sculptures, as we see here. But there is also um, one shirt in this exhibition. Um, why were you so interested in this particular um, clothing? Um, I think again, it's, uh, for me, it was about using my like own perception of object that I was collecting or interested by. And uh, like for me, starting a collection, and I never be collecting anything before, so starting a collection was also putting myself in the skin of the, the collector. And by starting a collection, I started to learn and make some research about the history of the objects. And by going through the history of the Hawaiian shirt, I discovered that the, percep the perception that uh, like popular uh, Occidental people have, um, it's pretty different as what is the, um, like the actually uh, status of the object in his own history. And through the researches of different type of object as a Hawaiian shirt or has the, um, the Pacific landscapes, I discovered a lot of violence be behind them. Um, which was a lot of things through um, colonization and also globalization and a uh, lot of uh, ecological issues. So I started working with several elements as a Hawaiian shirt, the um, landscapes from the Pacific and the uh, pineapples and all these kind of um, objects and elements that are kind of symbolic of my perception of uh, this kind of uh, worldwide uh, exoticism notion. Uh, started to make to be a uh, more um, proper element of research through history and the violence that is behind. And um, so at point the, the project started to take, take shapes by this kind of tension uh, between uh, an ideal uh, vision of paradise on earth, uh, which is in tension uh, with the more violent history, um, which is the reality. Yeah, because um, um, I'm very interested in how this, um, how photography itself uh, plays a role in this, not just through popular representation that photography is um, like feeding into, but also how you used um, uh, your own photography to create imagery that adds up to the um, uh, ideas of exoticism, but at the same time um, uh, subtly reveal uh, this, this side you were uh, just talking about that has to do with uh, colonialism and um, um, also the atomic tests that have been performed in the, in the Pacific. And um, it's interesting how you perform that through, um, for example, uh, this sculpture, which is currently behind the wall, so you will see it after the talk, um, uh, but in which, the, um, because you have been photographing the posters you've collected, but the photographic flash yeah. actually um, uh, evokes the idea of, uh, of an explosion. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think like the, the process and the methodology of the work have been like building through the research and also the, the photography act um, and how to act photography with already made images or already made objects. And for me it became, the project started to be like really taking shapes when I was able to um, build um, kind of photography sculptures that are two things at the same time. Uh, for me that that's how uh, I try to build attention in one piece, and then I try to make the different pieces dialoguing together in a space or in a book or anything. And um, so, yeah, for the like the, the images of these erased uh, landscapes, um, that was a poster that I ordered, and they arrived to the studio. And I was at this time interesting by working with the materiality of the, of the images and not only with uh, the representation. And I worked through a uh, memory that I have from a previous travel uh, when I was uh, in the west of the US and I seen in a gift shop in Monument Valley a uh, tourist making a picture of a poster and this poster was uh, representing exactly the same landscape that, that was for real outside of the shop, which was pretty funny. And as a photographer, when I seen 
uh, this guy making a picture by using the direct flash straight on the glossy paper, uh, it made me a bit laugh to imagine what would be the result of the, of the image. And with this memory, when I was in the studio with my own posters, I decided, I don't know exactly why, but I decided to react this memory. So I um, make this, this, I made this kind of um, reproduction picture, really bad reproduction picture of the posters by using the direct flash straight on the glossy paper. And uh, at the beginning, what, uh, what came out of this act was uh, an image that was erasing in the first uh, kind of response that I had from it was uh, the idea of over um, representation of these images. Uh, and I thought it was like a bit interesting, but also kind of obvious. But when I show these images for the first time with, uh, with uh, an artist called Michael Stevenson, who's from New Zealand, uh, the first question that he asked to me was, are these images related to the atomic explosions uh, in the Pacific Ocean? And uh, like from Switzerland, I was not, um, I didn't have that much information about the history of the atomic explosions on the, and the atomic tests on the, on the Pacific. So I decided to like to switch the research and, um, and to use this uh, response as a new material to, to work through. Um, so yeah, the, at the end, the, the, these images are like representing two things at the same time, it's one way. Uh, on one side is the, like the explosion, or at one side it's, uh, it's the poster itself, it's the kind of beautifulness and the paradise on earth. And at the same time, it's also a representation of the um, atomic explosion, uh, which is also pretty strong in the iconography um, in photography history. Yeah, so your work is really in a accumulation of images, objects. Uh, so there's a lot to explore and, and actually a lot to talk about for 10 more minutes or 20 or 30. Um, just a, on a final note for our conversation, um, it's interesting to hear that you were already um, restricting yourself in, in traveling. And uh, as you uh, spoke so nicely that you already that you already accustomed to making uh, pictures travel to you instead of the other way around. Um, so I hope you don't feel too restricted by the pandemic or would you like to say something on how it's uh, affecting your practice, if it is at all? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure it is uh, in different ways. Um, like the first, it's more the practical ways, like I'm based in Berlin, but still working in Switzerland, so I have to like travel a lot between both countries. So that's starting to be a bit complicated, but that's not really interesting. But uh, I think for me and like few of uh, friends of me who are, who are artists too, uh, the pandemic situation was um, like speed, speed maybe tough to say that like this, but it was a kind of gift to have a bit the time slowing down because it's like, I think it's the case for a lot of um, like young artists. It's, we are uh, a bit struggling with how to make enough money to be able to work also on the artworks. So having a bit this um, pressure going down without having that much work, but having way more time. Uh, for me, it was a lot of mind space and I was also finishing this project at the time. So. Uh, for me, it's important for every like beginning of projects be able to like clear a bit my mind and uh, and take time to think about like really uh, large uh, scale. So having a lot of time for this was really, uh, in a sense, a gift. Well, then um, we should keep an eye on you to see what uh, what's up next. Uh, thank you so much for uh, um, for talking about the work. And then next, I would like to invite uh, Alba Sari to the stage. Thank you. Hello, Alba. Thanks for joining us all the way from, from Italy. Uh, Alba told me she made a, a pit stop in um, Switzerland because she just installed uh, her exhibition at the Photo Museum Winterthur. So uh, um, she had a silent opening there and on her way to the next here. So you're doing well, I suppose. Yes, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. It feels strange to, to travel, but it's, uh, it's good. I'm really happy that this is happening and 
even in Switzerland, you know, things are going slow, but they, they are going, so yeah. Um, we are um, uh, presenting your project, The Why, um, which is actually a very, very personal project um, um, on the research of who your actual father was after, um, after your discovery that the man who fought you uh, was your father wasn't actually through a DNA test, uh, which explains the title uh, of your project. Could you um, maybe introduce the project to us? Yes, so as you said, the Y is uh, the male chromosome, and it started because I did this uh, DNA test on uh, uh, the person that I thought was my father for 25 years. And I traveled to Berlin, actually, in 2016, and I wanted proof and facts. So this um, project has a kind of emotional distance because I tried to collect objects. I've been through my archive, and I tried to discover the truth on a scientific kind of point of view. So the first step, the first start is this DNA test, where you can see it's um, the probability of paternity is uh, 0%. And from that, this is my, my start. And um, after that, I did an ancestral origin test, and it traces only the X. So women generate a double X, and the missing chromosome, so it's like the missing part that I'm trying to find in myself, in my identity, is the Y. So it's the male chromosome, and yeah. And um, um, the project is, is very much linked to photography um, as um, already this picture is showing, but also um, and these over here that are from family albums that you thought give you, gave you the, well, the proof or document of who, um, who is part of your family. Um, and in hindsight, you've been questioning um, yeah, the truthfulness of photography, actually. Um, would you comment on that? Yes, so in the moment I found out the truth, it's weird because I found out when I was you know, not so young. So when I um, look, I had like already memories of my childhood and attachment to pictures. So I moved to Italy when I was eight years old from Thailand. I was born in Bangkok. So I thought for all my life I was Thai and I grew up in Thailand and that, that person was actually my father. So in the same moment I, I thought about how like memories can lie in a certain sense, how they can be manipulated and how they can tell a, a whole story and how photography is uh, doing this, I think, since the history of the start of photography. And, and it was very interesting for me to, because that was you know, my studies and my masters, and at the same time I you know, was questioning my, my personal and private life, and also photography as a medium in itself. So I started to erase not a race, to paint on and to create this silhouette and, and uh, you know, think about this unknown person in, uh, in my family album. So that's this process. Then, you know, your, um, your project um, uh, consists of so many elements, so also you've been really um, uh, sort of researching yourself, your own body, trying to make comparisons. Um, to look for clues about um, your actual father. Um, how, what is it like to put the camera on yourself in that way and also exhibit it and put your identity on display? Well, it's a, it's a necessity. So uh, when I was doing it, I really wanted to know, I really wanted to have a picture of this a person, you know, because my mother is uh, is blonde, and uh, my grandmother she's like half Napolitan, so she's short, and I'm like, where am I from? So where are my features from? So I um, these uh, pictures are from I took them with, as a self-portrait with a large format camera, um, trying to think of like the aesthetic from Lombroso, so this medical scientific kind of self uh, representation where I really study my features, so my eyes, my nose, my mouth, and they belong to my biological father. So this is how I tried to yeah, study the physiognomic process to have an idea of how he could look like. Because this is still um, a picture of, um, well, who you thought to be your father. father. Yeah. yeah, Thai. And I should be half Arabic, so a bit different from Thai Asian origins. <laughs> 
could you maybe uh, quickly walk us through these men that are actually on display on the wall behind here? Yes, so the first person, uh, uh, Johnny Wirachat, he is a person that I thought was my father for 25 years. And this picture, I did it just the minute after he did the DNA test. Uh, it's in a very cold and rational way, but for me it says a lot how he's looking at the camera. I don't know, I, it's, I try to be rational in taking these pictures and take away the emotional attachment, but I feel there is, uh, because of the contrast of how it's aesthetically represented. And so I try to, to take a portrait, like an um, um, identity card, so I really want to read the features, and from every kind of point of view. So it says about this obsession to find uh, my, the identity in, in the features. Then uh, um, Agostino, my brother, that is uh, the person uh, on, the, um, on the bottom. Yeah, the <laughs> bottom. Um, I wanted to compare his features to my, um, his father. And in the middle, when I was doing this uh, research in 2016, doing the residency of uh, Fabrica, I actually collected my birth certificate and I found out in that moment that this blonde guy is my legal father and he signed my birth certificate. But he's not my actual biological father. I didn't get the blue eyes, so no. <laughs> And then, oh, we arrive to what your yes. biological father should look like, look most like. probably. Yeah, so I created a 3D avatar because I couldn't, in this uh, you know, research that took me a few years, many years, and it's going to be still ongoing, I don't know. And I couldn't find an image of him, so I recreated uh, an identikit, an avatar, from the physiognomic uh, study that I did on myself before, so that it was a, I use photography as a tool, even in this case, I use a program, make a human to reconstruct him, and then blender to, to take a portrait of him. So in every way I use photography in a very different way, it's a tool for me to get to a result. And the end is a self-portrait, a portrait that I did in uh, Bangkok, and my eyes are closed because it's like internalizing and accepting that that's it. That's because you um, you actually tried to uh, do an, um, a reverse image search with the avatar mm -hmm. in the hopes of that Google would give the final answer. Yes, I put him even in Google. No, no but way. no results. No. no. Um, last but not least, um, you just told me that you are working on a second chapter that you actually have been able to use the, um, the time of the lockdown to be extremely productive. Um, so could you already give us a peek into um, what you're working on and what can we expect from you next? Yes, so during this project, many people ask me about the role of um, my mother. So this is a very, you know, project dri dri driven on my identity and on the research of my father, but it's true that you know, the next step is um, this question about why my mother doesn't know the identity of my biological father and why also like um, Gary, that is this blonde guy, signed my birth certificate. So all these questions are that were in the first project, I think has have to be answered in the second one. And it's about uh, a cult. So I was born in uh, Bangkok in an uh, American uh, religious sexual cult called the Children of God. And uh, they believed in like flirty fishing and religious prostitution. So my mom had to serve this, um, you know, this cult with my grandmother, and uh, and that's why I don't know the identity of my father. So it's a lot. It's a feminist project about how women's body were used by you know cult and in the biggest scale patriarchy, and it will tackle these bigger questions always in a very private and intimate uh, point of view. And these are the first part that I'm working on, uh, on the archive, my family archive and the archive of the Children of God. And yeah, I've been, I traveled in uh, uh, January, February and March and I came back and the pandemic was exposed so I had the time to edit. But I was in India and I followed all the steps of my mother in Nepal and in Thailand. So for me, like these months were slowing down, editing, thinking about the work, 
And yeah, time is a big, it's a big thing. It's a big gift. So it's uh, it really adds uh, a whole other dimension to the to the work that's on display here. So you actually have this sort of um, sneak peek into um, uh, what what will be next. So uh, we surely will keep an eye on you. And thanks for already sharing this with us because it's. Uh, it's, it's very exciting what you're working on, and also um, I really admire your um, how brave you are in in sort of putting yourself on display and sharing um, how photography can be used as a as a tool, um, um, but also um, you're questioning the medium at the same time. So it's um, a very intriguing, intriguing project, and um, uh, I hope you will take a, a careful look into this. Uh, Expensive research. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Thank Alba. Thank you so much. Thank you. Then next up, uh, I would like to invite Anna-Marie Beckmann, uh, director and curator of the uh, Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation and uh, a sponsor of Foam Talent. Uh, Felix Hofmann, uh, the chief curator from CEO Berlin, and our own uh, artistic director, Marshall Fell, for a panel discussion um, on uh, nurturing talent in um, times of the new normal. <laughs> Here you go. We are the same household. Ah, we're not. <laughs> we're not. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the artists present here uh, for being here, but also showing the willingness to present themselves and to present their work. Um, sometimes it requires really braveness. Uh, in case of Alba, it's such a personal story, but I think it goes for, for everyone. Also, Adesso Khan, I just learned about the events in Lagos and protesters being killed when the military opened fire uh, at the protesters earlier today and after the midnight curfew. Really wonderful that despite these alarming things, you can be here and you're here. Thank you so much. Thank all of you for being present. Um, for us, it, it's really important to have you here as well because, um, of course, we, we published uh, the work in Foam magazine um, and a magazine is in a way a traveling exhibition that can be seen by lots of people all around the world and it can also be seen later on after a month, a year, ten years perhaps, so it's a lasting document we hope. Um, but of course the exhibition here with the real physical work is, is, is very important to do justice to the artistic practice and the work. But having the artist here, I think it's essential because uh, getting to know the artists, hearing their voices, their opinions is, uh, is a very important element for a proper understanding of who they are and why they do what they do. And for us it's important to also uh, present them to a large audience uh, of, I hope, photography lovers, but also to, to a professional audience, because this might be a way that professionals from the photographical field get to know these artists better, and perhaps uh, will also collaborate with them uh, in the future. For us, it's therefore also important, being in Berlin, being in Germany, to have two, well, representatives from the professional photographical field here in, in Germany, Annemarie Beckmann from the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation and Felix Hoffmann from CEO Berlin. Um, we know each other already for quite a while, um, but it's all about also presenting one another to, to the world in a way. But perhaps you can briefly introduce your organization and perhaps with a focus also on talent. What does photographical talent mean to you and how do you work with it, support it or whatever you do with talent? Annemarie, may I invite you to, to do the kickoff? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, um, I am the director and the curator of the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation. Um, we're a charitable foundation based in Frankfurt. Um, we started, Deutsche Börse, which is running the German stock exchange, started collecting contemporary photography more than 20 years ago. And um, the collection is still growing. We have about 2,000 works, which you can see on the website. And over the years, I've been there from the beginning, over the years, uh, besides collecting contemporary photography, we started doing exhibitions and funding and supporting artists, institutions, projects, and also um, especially young artists. So this we have all shifted into a foundation in 2015. 
Um, so what we do is that we accompany young artists. It's been something that has been on my mind, of course, from the beginning. Um, also out of curiosity to see what is happening in the art world. How do young students, artists deal with the medium, evolve the medium. Um, but of course, because it's in a very important part of what we do to support them, to give platforms to them to present their work to, to their work to to different audiences broader audiences so what we do is for example that we collaborate with the art schools nearby in frankfurt and offenbach so accompany them on a regional basis i personally teach on a voluntary basis so i'm in quite in touch with the students we do an annual award uh, when they have their Rundgang, I don't know the English word for this, uh, the annual Rundgang, uh, we do a, ph a photography award for, for um, students that are still visiting the art school, that are dealing with the medium photography. Um, we create projects together with the Courage Hill Studies um, School in Frankfurt. Uh, we invite them to do exhibitions in our premises, um, or give them the means to produce a catalogue. Um, so this is for mainly for artists who are really at the beginning of their career. We used to be the funding partner of the CEO Talents, so that was one bigger project that we accompanied for almost 10 years. And since a couple of years, we are now partner for the Foam Talents. Um, and very happy to, to support this. I mean, you're here, you can see what Foam Talents is um, realizing. I think it's, it's an amazing program. Uh, a, a really international audience, a, a very international um, young artists who are supported um, by the magazine, which has a huge distribution, but of course by these um, exhibitions. And I'm, I'm very happy to see the exhibition here, and I think it's a compliment to Miriam, to what you've done with that space, a compliment to the artists, of course. We've been showing the, the Talents exhibition in our premises, um, so this is an important step in what we do. Um, but we also started a new collaboration with the Deutsche Gesellschaft for Fotografie, not only to support young artists of photography, but only the writing of photography. I think it's important that we have always support people who are um, having the theoretical approach to the medium. And then, of course, we do the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation Prize together with the Photographer's Gallery for, I think, 15 years now, more than 50 years, um, which I would not see as a talent award because um, the shortlisted artists and the winners, uh, there is a mix. It's artists that have been, have a long career, but it's also young artists um, that are awarded or shortlisted for this prize. So this is mainly the, the range of uh, what we do um, concerning the talent. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Felix, can I yeah, ask you the same question to briefly introduce you yeah, and CEO yeah. Berlin? So when I started at CEO Berlin in 2005, um, I had the, the feeling or the wish not only to show famous names because CEO Berlin was entirely independent. So we really lived from the entrance fee. So we, it, now it's, it's changing, but um, at that certain point it was, uh, it was always necessary to, um, to attract a lot of people. And I had the feeling not only to make exhibitions with big names, I tried to find a partner to develop a talent program. And then we had four talents per year. We made single exhibitions and we combined the talents with young art critics or writers. And we made four books. And uh, for 10 years we made this with uh, Ami. And uh, she's the, the bridge between us and uh, for this idea is to, to do something for young people because it's, it's really in the... DNA of CEO Berlin to promote and help and to find ways to to help uh, in this um, 
in this world of photography or visual images. And, um, uh, and then we noticed that uh, <laughs> when, we, when we did four books and four single exhibitions, it's quite a lot for a, for a small team. And we changed the program. So we, uh, uh, in 2016, we changed the program. And uh, now we make one exhibition with the talent of the year and uh, make a different book out of it and, uh, and try to find another structure. So it's very interesting here now to, s to see these kind of range uh, and varieties in this, um, in this more than 20 talent uh, presentations um, uh, and in the reflection what we are doing that we are showing only one uh, talent per year, so it's a, it's. I think it's a different kind of structure, different kind of um, of narration, and that you combine it with a um, with with the um, the magazine. I think it's uh, it's something opposite. On one hand, on the other hand, it's a, it's the same field we are working in and I always, I'm always so happy that we try to find different ways to help these young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you Felix and you, you, I'm intrigued by the, the change you made from four to one artist. Uh, you briefly mentioned it is a lot of work. <laughs> I can tell you with 20 it's also quite some work. No, no, uh, it's more. But this is, a, pra this is a practical, it, it, it seems to be a practical consideration to go yeah. back to one, but I can imagine there were also other considerations yeah, yeah. to focus on only one artist. Can you, can you please share some of your lesser practical but perhaps more content-driven considerations? Um, no, we had uh, uh, we made a research, a long research, and uh, got an overview of all the programs in Europe, and then we rec recognized um, you are doing a, a rich field of talents, bringing them in exhibitions, trying to uh, develop uh, sustainability over the magazine. Then we had, uh, you know, there are several um, other. Um, prizes given to young artists or talented persons, and then we realized no. Um, in in our um, situation, we should focus, and that was a, a hard break break for me. It was really you know when I founded it in a way in 2006, I thought four is a good way what I can do f in one year, and then we realized no, it's too much. Because we would have, uh, we would need it more. Um, yeah, we would need it more help from outside. The team should be bigger. Uh, more money is necessary, so it's it's a financial issue, an economical issue, and uh, it's a question of capacity. This seems to be again practical considerations. Yeah, yeah. But if you now focus on, on one artist, what is what is the advantage? Can you deal with the artist in a in a different way that for you might be more valuable than the division between four? Um, I have. I mean, you mentioned focus, but yeah, I ha I have the feeling yes, uh, because we go deeper in uh, the materiality in the. Um, uh, in the publication, so we develop really um, a publication uh, where we have the feeling it's um, it's not something what we did before because we did four uh, similar books in a way over the years, and now it's really a single publication what needs more um, energy or money or something like that. Uh, a talent program might change over time, yeah. um, but of course, reality is also due to changes. Um, mm. Life is movement, so things are changing yeah, all, yeah. The, all the time, and perhaps now more fundamentally, uh, I wouldn't say than ever, but there is definitely a change going on in, in society. The fact that we are 
um, in a pandemic situation is one, but that perhaps is still, in retrospect, a rather shallow, mildly one. Um, although if you link it to an ecological change, it might be a symptom of a very big one. But uh, I also mentioned in my introduction, there's also economical changes, but also shifts in, in power. Um, the ones that had power have to make way for the ones that were underrepresented for years, and if not centuries. So this is also a huge change, uh, a global change, but also a change that will affect uh, cultural organizations, institutions. Uh, Anne-Marie, to what extent is this changing reality also affecting the Deutsche Börse Foundation or the way you think about the future of perhaps photography in the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation? Uh, well, definitely. I mean, there are two aspects. Of course, the pandemic aspect means that uh, a program that has been created about presence, physical presence of exhibitions or events has to be rethought. Mm. Um, how can you... I mean, we started with... We had cancelled exhibitions, postponed exhibitions, so we put all our efforts in the last months on working on our website, putting all the artworks that we have on the website which we couldn't do before, uh, making um, virtual tours, um, creating video, uh, Vimeo channels, things like that. This is just a, the practical thing. But why supporting artists, of course, I mean, and nowadays it might be much more important to help artists, for example, to create a publication or a website than doing a show, which we used to do, and, and, and bring audience to, to their works. So this is things we have to consider. Considering, uh, I mean, d diversity, uh, gender representation, or um, looking for underrepresented groups in our work and our collection, this is of course an important aspect that we have to, to, um, or that we do already uh, reflect upon. Um, but I think this is something that needs to be thought through, and this is something we partly cannot do on our own. But, uh, and this is what we have in mind at the moment for the foundation, to invite people from this group and have conversations and to see uh, together with them what are their expectations, what are their needs, and how can this be implemented in what we do on being more open, more broad, more diverse. Um, again, here to, to make quick shots or to decide by ourselves would go in the wrong way because then again we we think we know what these groups need, expect, or believe. So this is something we have on our agenda, but it, uh, as I said, it takes, it takes a moment and it takes other people to support us, and this is the way, or the path we've started now. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, this is something I can very much relate to. I'm, of course, in a sort of double capacity function here, moderating, but also representing foam at that extent. And I think uh, starting a conversation, as you said, asking questions, to external parties, whether these are artists or cultural organizations, not from the European or Western Hemisphere, and be open to, to have this conversation and to be rather modest, perhaps, in this conversation as well. I think it's very important. And, and Felix, I saw you confirming by nodding no, your it, head. I, I think it's a big learning process. Mm -hmm. And it's a, started not now, but started years ago. and. Um, and I think we can only um, go deeper in this learning process when we include other people with us. Because I, you know, I'm, I studied art history. I live now in Berlin more than 20 years. I'm white. I'm male, and um, I cannot change my cultural, religious, um, historical background but I can learn and include or integrate uh, other thoughts and invite people to um, discuss things, things and thoughts with me. And um, it's interesting to, to make this experience. Mm -hmm. To what extent does it also affect, almost on a daily basis, your relationship with, with, with artists that you work with, either for publications or, or exhibitions, and then perhaps particularly for a younger generation of, of artists that are, of course, born, raised, educated, and working very practically yeah. in this new reality, and that perhaps they represent and embody this reality perhaps more than, than others. 
Um, this is a difficult question because um, it's not so easy to, to reach other thoughts or other meanings, generations, cultural backgrounds um, and integrate them in exhibitions. So one, one example maybe, um, we did two years ago an Iraqi exhibition, a Japanese photographer had some problems with his models and there was a young group um, protesting in front of our building when we opened the show. Um, and this group was uh, named Angry Asian Girls and I invited this group of people to, um, to a panel discussion mm -hmm. and said, come to the exhibition, we can talk about your issues, about the problems, about that, what, what is here around. And they said to me, it was not really a conversation, it just came over social media, uh, it was not really an email dialogue, but um, they said I had to take down the exhibition first before we start a conversation. And then I said, okay, my cultural background is we are in Germany, when I have to take down an exhibition, it's for me like censorship, uh, I'm going back in the German history 70, more than 70 years ago. I have a problem with this. I will not take down an exhibition. So there was not um, the opportunity to, to deal with this problem or to start a conversation. And that was a sad moment for me as a creator, but I realized it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, there's a, there's, a different, there's a different sensitivity, there's a different self-confidence, um, there are many voices, um, sometimes too many voices, or I would say the loudest voices are not always the most, um, how do you say, profound ones, so it's, it's really, you have to be very open, um, you have to listen, you have to learn, and then, but you, I think then you have to also reflect uh, and see um, what is happening, what is, the, what is the expectation, how can I deal with it, and in what way can our institution, I mean, go out of the comfort zone, but in what way can the institution, with what, which, which steps contribute to what is needed now? I yeah. think this is... Yeah. I think this is a very important remark. Yeah. How and in what way can we contribute? Because it's not about the needs or objectives of the institution in itself. I mean, we are I mean, in a sense, facilitating mm. the needs of artists or arts and culture in, in general. Um, having said this, I mean, if we now focus on, on the pandemic for a moment, we already heard the artists that, of course, there are restrictions on traveling. It has a very direct effect on, on how they move around in the world and how they relate to the world. Um, slowing down was also mentioned. Is this also a time for you to slow down or is there because everything slows down, you have to increase. Felix, I see you laughing. <laughs> Is there a sense of recognition? No, uh, but, but we had a conversation, I think, uh, end of March, beginning of April this year, and we were just laughing to each other on the phone because um, uh, it was a hectic time to, to deal with the situation uh, because we are working into the future for more than two years with our program and uh, now it's uh, coming in a, I would say in a second wave and the problem is how we should deal with this situation now. Do we have to close the museum again and uh, what does that mean to the program, to our people we are, they are working for us and something like that. And sl slowing down is, of course, also perhaps needed to, to properly reflect on what you do. And yeah, yeah. people say, okay, <laughs> some things, well, it's, it, it's, 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 it's for, the, for the good. It's better that they don't return. Uh, the, what used to be normal was not that normal, perhaps, at all. So we have to accept and embrace, perhaps, a new normal. Um, Anna-Marie, to what extent are there things that you think uh, should not come back uh, within photography? Or are you more happy with the return of things as they were? Sorry for asking this very general, difficult um, question. 
Well, I think um, I must say, being here, I awfully miss seeing exhibitions, physical works. I remember when I did go into the first exhibition, and just it wasn't even one I really liked, but just being in front of the objects of artworks was was feeling so good. So this is something I really miss, and I miss meeting the people, having an exchange, not via Zoom or Skype or Teams or whatever. Um, but I must say, I mean, last year we had our anniversary year, so we had many, many projects. There was a craziness in, in events and in traveling, which was definitely not healthy, and it was also putting up a pressure. So many things were going on physically, um, even if you did only half of them, you had always a feeling that you're missing something, and that was creating a, a nervous, nervousness. And um, it was there was a lack of taking time, slowing down for projects, reading, um, doing research in a proper way, which I felt now in the last couple of months when I could do it, or I had the feeling I could do it more the way, the way it should be done. So to find a balance between that um, is something that I would uh, love to have uh, um, and to see um, that this can be implemented for the, on a long-term basis for, for the future of, of what we've been doing. But we've definitely learned. And, uh, and I must say, not seeing people, of course, and not having events is one thing. But on the other hand, we talked about it briefly today, um, through online um, platforms and talks, of course, you suddenly had access to many great people. Uh, you would probably never, ha never have, you could not have invited to come to your premises, but the conversations or panels or talks that were really interesting with people who would all also be at home and have time, and that was definitely a benefit of this period. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps it's good to say that uh, with our talent program we have, of course, uh, an outlet in print, the magazine. We have not a physical exhibition, but we're in the process of developing, partly catalyst by the, the crisis. We also develop now a digital platform, and uh, the talents that are presented here will be shown on the digital platform as well. Um, I hope we're in the midst of ending the whole developing process. With, with some sprints, we will be ready mid-November. So for everyone, it's good to, to keep an eye on this as well, and we can include also audio and video in it allows us to do more. Um, but but, but let focus, let's focus on, on photography far more than on personal experiences or organizations for the, the last, last part. Um, I mentioned that it feels that, that we are in limbo in a way, in a vacuum, without any proper sense of directions of where it will all brings us, will bring us. Um, and the title um, of the event today is Photography in Limbo. Um, Felix, we might be in limbo, but is photography also in limbo, or is photography more in life, alive than ever, and perhaps more capable of finding certain directions or proposals for photography uh, for the future? So, in, in general, is photography in limbo, and can photography be of any value in this crisis situation? Um. I don't know if photography is in limbo, uh, it's a question of perspective, but um, I think photography is more fluid and photography is not so grapeable how it was, I don't know, 20 years ago, because it's um, integrating moving images, we have more options to deal with photography, we are communicating over photography and I'm actually working on an exhibition uh, reflecting this situation that we are purely communicating over pictures. So we start with 19th century postcard ideas and end with uh, what we have now on social media channels. And I think I learned a lot over these kind of processes because my son always sends me um, pictures of his new sneakers and um, I always ask myself is he liking his sneakers does he want a new pair and because there is no comment to these pictures and 
Then I started to reflect what does that mean to a society dealing or communicating more and more over the pictures. And this is a, a big question to our institutions or to all of us sitting here, how we um, ask or how we integrate uh, questions of, of the society in our work and how we can reflect this or help a society to deal with this amount of pictures because we, all, we are all doing more and more pictures um, and maybe more what generations before us ever did. And this is a big question and I'm thinking a lot about this issue. There's a big task perhaps and responsibility for us as organizations, how to, um, how to deal with a situation where society is perhaps um, over flooded with images. But if we, if we zoom out, um, like I said, there's a lot going on in society besides the photographical reality or dynamics. Isn't it also that we as institutions should relate far more, and perhaps also in a different way, with society, um, instead of allowing artists to have something to say, which is valuable, the floor and facilitate their needs, but also have a more outspoken position as an, or uh, as an organization. Um, I mean, you already mentioned being open for conversation and external voices. Might it be also a way to relate uh, stronger or more genuine, this is more almost a, a moral issue, with, with society? Are we, or is the art world not too much detached from reality? Although they offer the floor to artists, but what about themselves? Well, first of all, um, our exhibition space is in a building that is an office building. So it's, it's like an, a huge open space building in between. So I think we br really bring art to people who come to work and they go in and the first thing they see is they run through an exhibition, whether they want or not. Um, so I think there is a basic co contact and uh, um, the audience we have is not an audience that has chosen to go into a museum, which is a very interesting and challenging dialogue. Um, sometimes more challenging than interesting, but it's it's uh, it's um, it's very important for our for our work. Um, and I think the what I said, um, the openness, the dialogue um, through the through the artists we show or the artists whom we give a platform, we fulfill this role. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. We do books. We do exhibitions. We. We, we support artists um, and this is the means that we have and through these means I think we should continue our path to, to, more, to a more diverse, more broad, more open mm -hmm. institution mm -hmm. and such member of society of course. Yeah. Yeah. Felix, uh, for you that, that same question, uh, relationships, connections, perhaps not with um, entities of partners that are all part of the cultural sphere, but with partners from the social field, from, from society? Uh, is this something that you think is uh, needed because it's lacking a little bit too much? Uh, uh, today I got a newspaper on my desk um, and this newspaper um, came out through a collaboration with uh, uh, with an institution here in Berlin, they take care about homeless people. And we have an own educational program and we invited the artists, Harald Hauswald, he is now on display at our museum, um, to work with them. And uh, they worked over photography together over a week. And then this newspaper came out they, you know, it's this uh, newspaper homeless people can sell on uh, subways and trains and on the street. And it, it really, um, you know, th th this was a moment where I sometimes, you realize it's something that it's necessary to go over the horizon of the museum, of the wall, and um, to deal with people. But you, it's not so easy to find this group here in Berlin. You know, it's 
and you need a lot of resource, a lot of people, and you need the right artists to speak the same language, and then you have something that makes you, you happy, or I was very happy. It's good to end with a happy note then. We, we, can, we can talk for much longer, uh, but time is, is, is limited. Um, we are still here. The artists are also still here. Please, um, if you're willing to ask questions or start a conversation, which is, I think, a key word, uh, please, please do so. Um, a few final remarks from my part. Uh, we mentioned already Phone Magazine, the talent issue. It's here and it's for sale. And you being here present allows you to have a five euro discount. So please use your ticket also as a voucher for the, obtaining the magazine if you haven't got one yet, but otherwise it's also a nice present for friends, so you're more, more or less obliged to walk away with a magazine, at least one. Um, we will change the setting here because there are benches, uh, but we need to change it because we will open the doors for, um, for other guests and visitors. To be honest, we have no idea how many will show up. Of course, there is a maximum for us, given the restrictions, um, but we need to reorganize here and, and, and clean a little bit. Uh, but there's lots to see and a lot of people to talk with. So uh, thank you for being present here uh, this afternoon on this wonderful Wednesday in Berlin. Uh, we hope that you uh, liked uh, the show and this modest conversation. Uh, please stay with us and hopefully we will see each other later on, if not in Berlin, perhaps at another venue somewhere around the globe uh, because we're talking about a globalized reality with a complex dynamics. Thank you so much again and uh, speak soon. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Marcel.